why a schoolie may not be right for you. Maybe. Let's get into some of the reasons why a school bus conversion or a schoolie may not necessarily be the right choice for everybody. So before I get started, I want to say there is a caveat to all of this, which is that if you have enough time, money, and know-how, or kind of any combination of them, you can do pretty much anything you want. These are not necessarily always going to be applicable for everybody, but they are good things to keep in mind, you know, if you're on the fence about it, if you haven't gotten one yet and you're thinking about it. It's stuff that we found out the hard way when we got our school bus and started the conversion, and I'd also like to say that we're obviously biased. We have a school bus and we love it. And even with all of the, the sort of hassles that we'll get into, we still wouldn't change what we've done. Number one, and this one is tough, but you need space for the conversion. You actually need some space to do the conversion ad, which makes sense and it's totally common sense. But at the same time, there are a lot of neighborhoods. There are a lot of cities municipalities, all of that kind of stuff that have HOAs or regulations or codes and code enforcement that's very strict on what kind of vehicles you can park in front of a house, how long they can be there, what you can be doing to them, and all of that. There are just some issues that kind of come with doing a big project like this that some neighborhoods and apartment complexes obviously would totally not be down for. Um, and that is definitely something that you need to know ahead of time before you, you know, come rolling up in your brand new school bus and then find out that, oh, no, you can't actually even park it here. So, you know, it is something to keep in mind. And we even had issues or more specifically, my family had issues because we did our conversion on my mom's property, which is zoned agriculture. It's a bunch of acreage. We have no immediate neighbors. And there was a homeowner's insurance inspector that came out to look at a tree and noticed the school bus and then sent my mother a letter saying you need to get that abandoned school bus off your property or we're going to cancel your homeowners association and so she had to submit a whole bunch of proof including photographs that it was an ongoing project it was not actually an abandoned school bus but she did almost lose her homeowners and so her homeowners insurance so definitely an issue that can come up and occur with doing a conversion and something to be mindful of Number two is if you don't want to have a hassle with legal stuff, getting a school bus is a chore and all components of it are also a chore. So how do you get the school bus home? How do you get a license plate for it? How do you change your tag type or your title type? How do you get insurance for it? All of those are a separate headache and they take a while to figure out. It varies from location to location and it is just a, it's just a pain really. So when we got our school bus, we, for the life of us, could not figure out how to get it home. Some people said that you could just drive it home. Some people said as long as you crossed out the school bus, you could just get it right on home. Other people said that you need to get temporary tags for it, which we couldn't because we didn't have insurance. And it was really quite a situation. And so we ended up just, you know, illegally driving it home. We lived a few miles away from the bus depot and we just, boop, 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 you know, drove it straight there and managed to blend in with all of the other school buses because we picked it up at the time where the other school buses were leaving to begin their afternoon route. So, you know, we lucked out, but we took a big risk in just getting the bus home to us. And then after that, it took us about three months to figure out how to get a license plate for it. We called multiple DMV offices. We spoke to tons of different people within each DM DMV office. We waited on callbacks that we never got. It took us ages before we finally found someone at one of the DMV offices that we hadn't talked to that did actually know what we had to do for a school bus conversion. And then we finally got the, in the information that we needed, but it was a pain. And then going along with that, if you want full, fabulous protection for your insurance, that is not going to happen. Most insurance companies one won't even insure school bus conversions and then the ones that do generally only offer the minimum insurance requirements for the state so we have the minimum that the state of florida requires and we cannot get anything else which you know if you're willing to take on that risk it gives you a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility with what it is that you're doing inside of your school bus so 
I did actually call our insurance agent, and we can, as long as we can rig up seatbelts to remain compliant with road safety laws, we could actually drive our bus in like a hammock chair and be totally within the the okay, acceptable things for our own insurance policy. So it gives you a lot of freedom, but it is also a level of risk that you are taking on whenever you begin your conversion. And so if you don't want to deal with that, then a conversion is not necessarily going to be a great option. This sort of kind of goes along with it. So this is number three. That is maintenance, upkeep, and warranties. If you want a new vehicle, if you want a vehicle that has got a great warranty on it, you want something that does not have a lot of maintenance, that is not going to be a school bus conversion. Unless you're buying a new school bus, in which case that's a totally different ball game, you know, but most school bus conversions come out of old buses. They are buses that have been retired by their school districts or by the counties and municipalities, you know, if you get transit buses and that kind of stuff, they've been retired and they've been retired for a reason. Usually, you know, they're old, they still have a lot of life left in them, but it makes it difficult to find parts, especially when you're dealing with older buses. We've had issues even going straight to the dealership. We spent an hour at an international dealership in Louisiana trying to figure out which air filter we needed because school buses are not standard. Even within each line and each make and model, there is a level of variation for each school district because they can kind of specify things that they want or they don't want and all of that. So there is no set level of standard for parts. And so for us and our air filter, there were like five different versions of the air filter that fit our make and our model and our year for our bus. And so we sat there at the dealership for an hour trying out different air filters, trying to figure out which one actually worked because even the dealership didn't know. So if you're trying to order parts online, it becomes really difficult to figure out exactly which version of the oil filter you need. And as the bus gets older, it is becoming more and more difficult to even find those parts to begin with. So that's a problem. And if you don't have a lot of experience with car maintenance and diesel engines and big engine mechanics and all of that kind of stuff, it gets more complicated just because we don't have the level of know-how that goes with it. And along with that, we're having issues finding people to work on the bus. So a lot of the big truck mechanics don't want to work on a school bus. The school districts won't actually work on something that's not a fleet vehicle. And so we are having some issues trying to figure out where we can go, how we can get maintenance on it, how we can get the parts. So that has been an ongoing struggle that we're dealing with and that I think a lot of people with conversions deal with as well. And so, and this is a minor thing that kind of goes along with the parts and everything, but most school buses come with speed limiters on them, which limit your speed either by miles per hour or by, or by RPMs, which is what ours does. And so it does make you slow. Like our top speed, even with our brand new tires, is 59 miles an hour. We're like real fast. But it does mean that, you know, you are going really slow. So every trip that you take is going to take a lot longer than you think it's going to. You're just going to be really slow, which is not necessarily bad. It gives you a big, very big bubble of space and it makes driving sort of relaxing because no one wants to hang around you because they all pass you. So you kind of end up by yourself on the road for like these huge stretches of time, which is nice. But, you know. If speed is a concern and you want to get somewhere faster, you don't want to spend a ton of time driving, it's going to be an extra step to get that limiter removed and to figure out, you know, how to get it removed, what kind it is, where you can do it, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's just an extra hassle that does exist with school bus conversions. Number four is that school buses have more limited living space than RVs. It's just an inherent issue with it. RVs, depending on the size of them, they can have tons of slide outs and they can actually double probably their inside living space. So an RV that is a comparable size to our bus, we've got a 35 foot long bus, which is a pretty standard middle of the road size for RVs. That RV can easily have double the living space that we have because they have slide outs. And we have so far seen one guy online do his own slide outs in his school bus conversion. And it was a huge project. And it's a project that we don't have the time, the know-how, or the monetary resources to even begin to attempt. So we just have to accept that the space that we have is the space that we have. You know, you can do roof raises. We see a lot of people that do those to add in some extra height because there is a level of variation in the height of school buses. So 
Ours is tall enough for both of us to move comfortably in, but a lot of people, especially really tall people, do end up with an issue where the school bus is actually too short for them to move in comfortably and all of that. So we see a lot of roof raises and they don't look super hard, but it is an extra step that you have to go through to kind of create more space to make it more comfortable. That is something to consider. Number five, and this does kind of go along with the more limited space, is that school buses are not built for comfort. They are built for short-term trips, you know, taking kids to and from schools and school bus stops. Like, that's pretty much what they're designed for. They are not designed for long-term driving, and they're not very comfortable for it. So school buses typically have a pretty rough ride. There is a reason why they have these nice air seats in them. So, you know, if you can afford those, they are totally great. Um, but school buses have a rough ride. They don't usually have air conditioning. If they have heat, it's either on or off. There is no, like, heat setting. It's either full blast or nothing. It is really hard to maintain a temperature inside of a metal box, especially compared to maintaining a temperature inside of a fiberglass shell like an RV. It heats up really fast. It cools down really fast. So in the winter, we are very cold, and in the, win in the summer, we are very hot. And this is where that spray-in insulation really becomes incredibly valuable to a conversion. And, you know, but if you take shortcuts in that area like we did, you do pay the price for it. And it is uncomfortable in a lot of ways. And so there is a level of discomfort, I think, that has to be accepted when you are doing a school bus conversion, especially if you plan on living in it full time like we are. There is just a level of discomfort that we have to accept in our daily lives. So number six is RV parks. And this goes with your version of, or your vision of what these trips will look like for you. If you're doing weekend trips, if you're doing long-term stays, what kind of, like what vision do you see of it? Is it boondocking? Is it, you know, chilling in the beaches? is it really nice RV resort parks? Because if it's really nice RV parks, a lot of them will not even take school buses. They're a little, you know, they're buses and they don't like them, but the really nice ones, and actually sometimes not even the really nice ones, just, you know, middle of the road RV parks won't even accept us. As soon as they hear school bus conversion, they're like, no, I don't think so. We had one RV park that wanted us to send pictures of our bus to them so they could vet that it looked nice enough. We had another one tell us that they didn't want our bus lowering their environment. We've had other ones, as soon as they hear that it's a school bus, flat out refuse to make reservations for us. Um, we had one that we stayed at, and we didn't tell them that we were a school bus when we made the reservation, but when we pulled up, they were so not happy with us, and they would not let us extend our stay when we wanted to. So, you know... That is a thing to consider, is that not all places are going to accept school buses. So far, we've never had an issue with, like, state campgrounds or campgrounds from, you know, the federal government or anything like that. National parks haven't had any issues with that. And KOAs, we've never had an issue with KOAs. They've all been super friendly and nice. So, you know, but if you want the really, really nice ones that are, like, right on the beach and whatever, you know, they might not accept a school bus conversion. And, you know... That really is going to be an issue more or less depending on how you see your trips or your full-time living or anything like that going. And then lastly, reevaluate your ambitions for a school bus conversion because there are beautiful buses out there. There are gorgeous, gorgeous, fabulous examples of craftsmanship and design and all sorts of stuff on Instagram and YouTube and they are just beautiful. And you know, we went into it like, we are going to have the best looking bus, it's going to be so fabulous, it's going to be great, and then as we got into it, we realized this is a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. And this goes along with the know-how, resources, time, all of that kind of stuff, you know, because if you don't have the building know-how, but you've got the money, you can hire out and get all of the nice custom stuff built for you. If you've got the know-how, you can build it yourself. Like, there are you know, workarounds to all of this, of course, but if you're on a budget and you don't have the know-how, it is difficult to get a very beautifully well-done bus because you don't know what you're doing, you know, or you don't have the money to buy the right tools or buy the absolute best material for whatever project it is that you're working on. So 
there are, we got a big reality check when we started the project, you know, and I remember looking at one guy on Instagram who was doing an Instagram series on his cabinets, like his beautiful custom made cabinets for his kitchen and they fit the curve on the roof perfectly and they were gorgeous and uniform and they all looked the same and it was really, really nice. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, that's fabulous. And then I looked into his profile a little bit more and he's a professional cabinet maker. Like that's what he does for a living and that's why his cabinets are so beautiful. And we're not professional cabinet makers. We would never have been able to build something to that level, you know, when we started out and probably not even now, you know, and we didn't want to pay full price for a regular cabinet. So we have to have for humanity did, which means that our cabinets are a little mismatched, but, um, still better than what we would have come up with ourselves. So anyway, the whole point of that is that, you know, if this is not a project that you have any experience with and you don't have a lot of money, then it is necessary to reevaluate the ambitions that you have for what your bus will look like. And that sucks, but that's just sort of, you know, something that goes into it. You know, can you make a beautiful bus? Of course, definitely. Is it going to be like the finest example of perfect craftsmanship ever? Maybe not, but that could be okay, depending on the level of what it is that you're looking for. Or that could be a make it or break a deal. It just depends on personal preference and, you know, that sort of stuff. So anyway, those are some of our reasons why a school bus conversion may not be the right choice for you. And definitely things that we have learned the hard way that made the process more difficult than we really had anticipated when we started. So yeah, I hope this video was interesting and helpful. And if you liked it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more stuff from us and we will see y'all in the next one. Bye.